Welcome to ADP Training, YouTube's automotive technology channel. In this channel, you'll learn all kinds of auto repair secrets, how your automobile works, and how to diagnose it. GDI Advantages Modern GDI systems provide a wider air fuel control range, are more fuel efficient and are easier to control. GDI is the next step in evolution from multi-point fuel injection, and offers another degree of emission control by eliminating the fuel portion being introduced along the intake manifold. By directly injecting fuel into the combustion chamber, the cylinder and piston are cooled thereby allowing higher compression ratios, a more aggressive ignition timing and enhanced power output. The fuel injection event itself is also highly managed, usually with dual or triple injection. One main advantage of GDI is the ability to inject fuel on top of the cylinder and to be able to control the injection event, as in a dual injection event mode. In addition the system can also be programmed with multiple injection at different times during a compression cycle. Here's how it works. During intake, the ECM commands for a very lean injection event, allowing the fuel and air to mix thoroughly. The air swirl is also controlled, but more on this later, and swirl also makes the mixture evenly distributed. Then, during the compression stroke the ECM commands a dual injection event for a final burn cycle. The dual injection makes mixture richer and therefore, helps to propagate the rest of the combustion. This feature of GDI is part of the different modes of operation of GDI injection and covered in details later on. But for now suffice it to say that the idea is to halt the injection event or the introduction of a rich mixture as late as possible to prevent pre-detonation and knock, which has always plagued GDI systems in the past. The latest advances in digital electronics is what makes GDI as we know it today possible. GDI erroneous NOx codes. Since the introduction of the NOx catalytic converter and the GDI engine, there have been various issues with this component. Almost all issues with the NOx catalyst are related to another system that prevents it from being regenerated. By regeneration we don't mean that a clogged NOx converter will get unclogged from the regeneration process. As seen on our videos, NOx catalyst regeneration means the purging of NOx or nitrogen oxide from the converter substrate material using HC and CO from a fast-acting quick mixture. Issues with the GDI NOx catalyst are all related to carbon chunks being blown out of the intake valves, although this is not an issue on the newer GDI engines, and the other is lean running engines due to vacuum leaks or another lean issue. These are the issues with GDI NOx catalysts. 1. Due to the fact that GDI engines breathe only air on the intake stroke, and fuel is injected right into the combustion chamber, older GDI engines did have issues with carbon deposits on the intake valves. The early GDI came to market in the late 2000s and after 2010 this issue is not not common. Any carbon deposit buildup on the intake valves can get dislodged and puncture the catalyst substrate. 2. A lean running engine due to a vacuum leak. 
A lean mixture will prevent the ECM from running the catalyst regeneration program. The reason is that the vacuum leak will still void the rich mixture catalyst generation cycle, whereby the AECM switches to a quick 3 to 10 second rich mixture to purge the NOx from the catalyst. 3. A faulty air injection system. The same holds true if the air injection pump keeps pumping air into the exhaust all the time. In this case, the extra regenerating HC and CO will get too diluted and regeneration will not be possible. Even if the air injection hose is also loose, the exhaust stream will suck in air and dilute the exhaust gases. 4. For some reason, lots of GDI engines also have an EGR valve. So, any EGR issue will get multiplied on a GDI engine, due to the lack of fuel washing the intake valves. In order to prevent issues with the NOx catalyst, there are things you can do to preserve this components over time. Even if you compare a PFI to a GDI engine, GDI will save you money on fuel, give you more power and besides, there isn't much difference between a regular PFI converter to begin with if you take care of either one. As a preventive maintenance you can do all of the following. Run a catch can on the oil fumes at the positive crankcase ventilation system, after the piece EV valve. This will prevent any oil from entering the intake and carbonizing the valves. Catch cans come in many flavors. Don't spend too much on one. It is not necessary. Use a steel wire mesh and a filter in the catch can if not supplied with one. It'll trap particulates and stop the mist from going into the intake. Most cans come with a petcock on the bottom that you can simply turn half a turn and drain. Use a wide diameter inline filter after the catch can. Spray in some valve cleaner to blow out the valve deposits every 10,000 miles. Drop a fuel treatment in the fuel tank, also every 10,000 miles to clean out the inside from fuel gum and moisture. This will not clean the valves, but it'll help. Every once in a while, drive the engine hard to blow out deposits from the combustion chamber and always allow the engine to reach operating temperature. It seems that GDI engines don't take kindly to short trips driving patterns. Basically, if you do the right preventive maintenance tasks and take care of your vehicle, a GDI will outlast any PFI. Consider that knowing that GDI is here to stay and will totally replace PFI in only a short time. GDI is here to stay. GDI exhaust temp sensor. On GDI engines, an exhaust temperature sensor is used. In certain cases, the ECM employs a desulfurization process by raising the exhaust temperature. A lean condition is used to affect a hotter exhaust and clean out the sulfur in the catalyst, and for that you need a way to monitor the exhaust temperature. By the same token, the ECM may also want to cool down the exhaust by momentarily cooling the exhaust, using a fast and quick richer mixture. All these processes happen fairly quick and are geared to elongate the life of both catalysts, the three-way and the NOx catalyst. During cold start of a GDI engine, homogeneous operation can be employed due to higher exhaust gas temperatures and resulting in a shorter time for catalyst light off. Gasoline engines do not normally emit soot emissions, but soot emissions can occur at very rich mixtures. However, the GDI engines emit soot at stratified charge operation, as there can be areas within the cylinder with very rich mixtures. Also in GDI engines, if mixture formation is not realized at full loads the soot emissions can increase. NOx emission is also greater at high cylinder temperatures. As loaded output rises, 
temperatures also rises and in turn, the NOx emissions also increase. NOx emissions increase widely at full loads. It is for these reasons that the ECM must know the exhaust temperatures at all times. In these cases, the ECM shifts the mixture ratio, leaner or richer, in order to control the output gases and protect the catalyst material. Two catalytic converters are successively used in GDI engine exhaust systems. A three-way converter, which has little volume and is connected close to the exhaust manifold, also called a baby converter. The other is the main catalytic converter which is an ox catalyst and has a higher volume than the pre-catalytic converter and is connected further away from the engine. An exhaust gas recirculation system is necessary, as the NOx after treatment systems may not reach high conversion. With the exception of the highest loads, exhaust gas recirculation or EGR system is used extensively to control NOx. The GTI exhaust gas temperature sensor has either one or two wires. It is a simple linear temperature coefficient sensor employing a thermistor device. The one terminal sensor is grounded at the body and are rarely seen today. These were used in early GDI engines. The two terminal sensor has a ground and a signal wire. This sensor works together with an internal resistor inside the ECM. Both the temperature sensor and the ECM internal resistor form a voltage divide network and the reference voltage is split between these two. The ECM takes the signal reading within the circuit between both, the sensor and the internal resistor. GDI Exhaust Temperature Sensor Testing most GDI exhaust temperature sensors have two terminals. It is important to remember that this sensor is connected in series with an ECM internal resistor. The ECM microprocessor takes the actual signal at the middle of the voltage divider network, or between the sensor and internal resistor. This is important to know for two reasons. One. If the sensor is disconnected and the signal wire is probed, you should see 5 volts, like any other sensor. But, if a load, such as another resistor or a test light is used to drop the voltage down and no change is seen, it means the ECM internal resistor is shorted, and the ECM should be replaced. On this sensor, the ECM provides 5 volts, through the internal resistor, don't worry about shorting this circuit to ground, the 5 volt reference voltage regulator is protected internally. Do not use a power probe on any computer circuit, however. Contrary to what most theoretical instructors say, a test light is fine to be used with this circuit, if connected to ground. The test light bulb actually works like a resistor. If an instructor ever says not to use a test light on 5 volt reference circuits connected to ground, you simply say, cuckoo, cuckoo. In this video series we teach you how to fix cars, not theoretical mambo jumbo. Testing the GDI exhaust temperature sensor is fairly simple. First, disconnect the sensor and probe for a 5 volt reference using a multimeter. Second, with a test light only, connect the test light to 12 volt power, and probe the sensor ground cable. The test light bulb, not to be confused with an LED test light, draws about 300 milliamps, which is fine for any ECM circuit. A lit test light proved proper ground. If a test light is not used, and a multimeter instead, you may get 0 volts, but not a proper ground. The test light stresses the ECM ground without danger. Third, reconnect the sensor connector, connect your test light to chassis ground, also connect the multimeter to the sensor signal wire. Then, momentarily ground the signal wire on and off, while observing the multimeter voltage change. If you see no change, then the ECM is faulty. If you see a change then ECM circuit for this sensor is fine. 
If your issue is that the temperature sensor is stuck in one value or giving out an erroneous value, the only recourse here is to replace the sensor, since you have already proved your ECM circuitry. This detailed procedure should guide you in the proper direction. GDI Injector Testing The newer GDI injectors are a far cry from normal PFI style injectors. GDI injection systems use different ways to trigger their injectors, as well as varying pressures. In other words, on GDI engines the high pressure at the fuel rail changes according to demand. By definition, this means that the electrical conditions will be changing as well. On a PFI injection system the pressure stays steady at 35 to 60 PSI, depending on the system. Nominal PFI injectors draw about 900 milliamps. On the other hand, GDI injectors use a peak and hold triggering scheme, much like the older big throttle body injectors, with the difference being the voltage and current values employed. GDI injector internal resistance ranges between 2.6 to 16.3 ohms, depending on application. Following, we'll explain exactly how GDI injectors are triggered and how to test them. The analysis of the waveform will show you how to read the waveform in the oscilloscope or graphing multimeter. A typical GDI injector current waveform shows a few points of interest. One is the injector turn-on point, signified here by the sudden rise in current. This turn-on point can go as high as 12 amps on a GDI injector. Again, it all depends on the fuel demands for that particular engine condition. The turn-on current value will change according to demand. Also remember that the GDI injector open event is way faster than PFI, at about 0.4 to 5 milliseconds, compared to a typical 5 to 15 or higher millisecond PFI injector open event. 2 is the first stage of the hold current. The idea behind peak and hold is to supply a high current to quickly activate or open the injector needle. Being that GDI fuel pressures are a lot higher, you need a lot more current to pray open a GDI injector, hence the high 12 amp value. Once the GDI injector is open, then in order to protect the injector coil, current is then clipped down by an internal ECM resistor to about 5 amps. This allows the injector to stay open to the exact same aperture as before, or during the 12 amp current spike but with a lot less heat. 3 is the second stage in the hold current, which is set at about 2.5 amps. Not all GDI systems have this second hold stage, but if so it is there to keep the injector open and further protect it from heat damage. If available, the second hold stage is employed when injector opening reaches the higher values, or above 3.5 milliseconds. Following, we'll explain how to test the GDI injector. Testing the GDI injector is no easy matter, due to the fact that their pressure, current and voltage value is always changing. By far, the fastest way to test the electrical health of a GDI injector is using a clamp-on amp probe. By clamping around either the injector wires, you can get a clear reading of the current waveform, as seen above. Then compare the readings to the analysis that was done before. There is one other very important aspect of GDI injection, which is the fuel injection pattern. The pattern on a GDI injector is now as important as the electrical characteristics. There are two ways to ascertain the pattern, one is using a manual injector tester, similar to the one used for diesel injectors and a GDI injector pulser. These small hydraulic jack-type little machines can test for pressure and injection pattern, 
when the GDI injector is actuated by the pulser. It is even possible to clean injector residue by using the proper injector cleaning detergent fluid with the machine. It is also important to understand that on any injector, whether GDI or PFI, it is important to do a stress procedure before cleaning or electrically testing the injector. A stress procedure is done by rigging a current limiting resistor circuit and actuating the injector for at least one minute. A suitable ceramic resistor in series with the injector will do, and in case of GDI injectors, a 40 volt power supply that can deliver at least 5 amps is also needed. Simply activating the GDI injector for about a minute, at a nominal 2 to 3 amps will get the GDI injector stressed out and ready for testing. 99% of all injectors fail when nice and hot, not before. After stressing the injector, any anomalies will become evident on the current waveform, which can also be recorded using the injector pulser. GDI Fuel Pressure Sensor Modern GDI or gasoline direct injection engines need various components to give the ECM some feedback on engine crankshaft and cam position and rate of change. The ECM also needs a very important value in addition to many other inferred parameters, it needs a fuel pressure value and gets this parameter from the fuel pressure sensor. With GDI the older fuel pressure sensor is a totally different device construction. It has to withstand about 2,900 psi of pressure or even more upon peak values. As a rule, GDI fuel rails are much stronger and thicker in construction. Another difference in GDI as opposed to PFI is that on GDI upon cranking the engine, there has to be a rapid high fuel pressure rise. The engine will not start until there's enough fuel pressure in the high pressure fuel rail system. This means that the fuel pump's check valve and pump itself has to be at its optimum at all times. Residual high pressure leaks also have to be minimized. During all this mayhem, it is the fuel pressure sensor the one in charge of keeping track of it all. It is important to know that on GDI, the injection event can occur at either intake, or during compression. This mode of operation will greatly affect the injection high pressure target. The engine synchronization is also of utmost important during GDI engine start up. One aspect of GDI engines is that of fuel vapor formation in the fuel rail. On GDI engines, the low pressure pump has to start pumping before the starter motor engages. So long as there's vapor in the fuel rail, the GDI high pressure pump will not build up pressure during startup and the fuel pressure sensor will inform this to the ECM. The end result is the ECM not commanding ignition due to no high pressure build up creating excessively long startup times. Finally, a little-known secret about many GDI systems is that the low-pressure pump may also run when the vehicle is off during the night for up to one second, and no more than four to five times during a six-hour period. This is done to maintain fuel pressure on the fuel inlet, minimize the formation of fuel vapor and air, and not to drain the battery. So, the biggest enemy of any GDI fuel system, fuel vapor, can be eliminated by simple ECM software programming and turning the low pressure pump on during the off soak period. In this way, as soon as the engine cranks, the fuel rail pressure sensor will indicate maximum pressure and the ECM can resort to compression injection, which is the desired mode of injection during cranking and start up. The consequences to this during diagnostics is far reaching. Now, in case of a long or slow start condition, one of the first areas to look to is the low pressure pump keeping pressure during engine off condition, no residual pressure loss, 
no air in the systems, and a rapid low pressure buildup upon start up. GDI does not accept a mildly weak electric fuel pump as it is the case with many port fuel injection systems where pressure is important, but not this critical. GDI High Pressure Pump The GDI High Pressure Pump is a compact high pressure single piston pump. It is equipped with an internal pressure relief valve to limit the maximum fuel pressure. It also has an integrated demand electronic solenoid control for metering the amount of fuel supplied into the high pressure fuel system. The main advantage of GDI engines is that the fuel is directly injected into the combustion chamber. The GDI high pressure pump is driven by the camshaft itself. It can supply from 40 to 200 bars or 100 to 2900 psi. The actual output pressure is controlled by the ECM through the internal pressure relief solenoid. GDI require fuel injection with high pressure, directly in the combustion chambers, in order to improve the process of atomization of fuel and to accelerate the preparation of the mixture. Very precise fuel pressures are required depending on engine operation. The GDI built-in pressure control solenoid is a for the most part a peak and hold device, which works like the old-fashioned big throttle body injectors of the past. The ECM provides a high peak current then a lower holding current to keep the pressure solenoid open. The pump is mechanically driven by a camshaft lobe over bucket tappet. As the pump plunger is moved backwards, the primary electric pump fills up the high pressure pump internal chamber at about 43 to 72 psi. In normal forward motion of the plunger, fuel is pressurized up to 2,900 psi or according to the pressure relief solenoid. Any excess fuel pressure is released back into the fuel inlet. The ECM controls the specific time at which the pressure relief solenoid is closed. So long as it's open, fuel is pushed back into the fuel inlet. There's also a check valve type that prevents the high pressure build up on the fuel rail from being lost. In other words, if the desired pressure is reached, which is inferred by the ECM from the fuel pressure sensor, the pressure control solenoid releases the fuel back into the inlet and no pressure build up is seen. The ECM actually times the exact pressure solenoid actuation at the camshaft lobe starts to rise. For all this to work, the ECM needs to know camshaft position and fuel rail pressure. The pressure solenoid also called volume control valve is actuated at certain camshaft positions. With these GDI engines replacing the camshaft is a serious affair and camshaft adjustment is always considered. The fuel delivery volume and pressure is adjusted depending on engine speed number of cams, and engine condition. This is all programmed into the ECM fuel delivery map software. GDI High Pressure Pump Construction New modern GDI or gasoline direct injection high pressure pumps can be of two types, the three piston pump and the more common single piston pump, with a pressure and volume control solenoid. This single piston GDI high pressure fuel pump is suitable for most homogeneous and stratified combustion gasoline direct injection engine schemes. Its roller follower or tap at cam drive plunger designs reduce friction and contribute to fuel economy and greater power. The pump is an engine driven, 
on-demand control pump that features a single piston and integrated design, also supporting a wide range of engine software maps. It delivers operating pressure from 30 bar to 200 bar, or 100 to 2900 psi. These pumps offer a high flow capability for larger displacement engines. GDI fuel pumps includes an integrated flow control valve for accurate fuel control and an integrated overpressure relief valve. A one-way valve is also included, which helps maintain the fuel rail internal pressure. Seen here we can see the cam lobe actuating on the GDI high pressure pump, plunger and piston. Upon simple observation it is a normal piston pump, with nothing extraordinary about it. However, the key component here is the fuel pressure control solenoid to the right of the pump side. The ingenious ingredient here is the high processing power of the ECM used to control the pump solenoid. The idea is for the ECM to control the exact point in time of when to close the fuel control solenoids. For this to work the ECM needs to close the solenoid at the exact time to build up pressure according to the engine demand. If the GDI pressure control solenoid were to remain closed at all times, then the pump would also supply full pressure all the time, which would cause all sorts of issues with the injection event. There is also the matter of fuel volume, so the ECM has to fully control the pressure and volume at the same time. The ECM needs the crankshaft and camshaft position, fuel rail pressure sensor value and be able to actuate the high pressure pump solenoid. Seen here, as the camshaft actuates the plunger, the ECM closes the upper one-way valve to prevent fuel pressure from returning back to the plunger piston chamber. In other words, the fuel rail pressure stays the same even if the engine is shut off. Also, as the plunger and piston moves upwards, the ECM monitors both the fuel pressure, engine speed, cam and crank position, engine load, transmission gear and various other parameters to then make a decision as to the exact time when to close the control solenoid. ECM or engine computers have been doing this for many years now, but keep in mind that on GDI engines, the injection event lasts only for 20.3 milliseconds. In other words, you need a very fast computer to control the high pressure pump solenoid accordingly. This is the reason why GDI was out of the question just a few years back. The very short injection timing events make this technology cutting edge and state of the arts. It will also present future technicians with diagnostic scenarios that are even hard to comprehend today. Good training is the proper course of action. Hello everybody and welcome to another video. In today's video we are going to uh, briefly uh, talk about the GDI PISO injectors and the PISO injector tester. The PISO injector tester uh, was developed by our company uh, precisely to test uh, these uh, injectors. Uh, this, the, this particular tester is good for uh, GDI diesel injectors and uh, uh, also um, for, for gasoline injectors. Like for example the ones seen on uh, BMWs and some of the European ones. We also have a magnetic injector, but that's uh, you can see that in another video that we have here on our channel, ADP Training. Now here on screen is uh, an animation that we have uh, that uh, shows you uh, the operation of these injectors, the internal operation. And basically what it is, is a stack. Uh, you can see the stack here, in, uh, uh, it's like uh, blue and green. Uh, and that that stack is the one that is a crystal stack. That's why it's called piso. Piso means crystal, and that's the one that actually that actuate the injectors, the injector pintle, but not directly. If you look at it in the center, it's like a little chamber, like a little square. That's a hydraulic chamber, and that's the one that actually pushes 
the pintle back and forth. There is no direct link between the stack of product crystals and the injectors, uh, the injector pintle. Search our channel ADP training and we have a, another video that goes in very in detail in, into how these injectors um, operate. Now as you can see this is the injector uh, tester in operation. Um, it, it has everything you possibly think that you would need um, to test these injectors. The voltage is variable uh, and it has uh, the separate switches for to change the pulsation, the pulse width of these injectors. And the pulse width is not like a regular injector. It goes, v it goes into the microsecond range, okay? In the center, you have the button to actuate the injector. If you just want to do a pressure, uh, uh, an injector flow test using a gauge, okay? And then you have the switch, uh, which is like a button, but it's just, uh, it switches on, um, it bypasses the button and it switches the, the unit on. Now, if you do want to test, uh, flow test these injectors, you're going to need a gauge and you're going to need some kind of a, a way to pressurize the injector, okay? And uh, there's a cheap, very inexpensive, uh, and it looks like a hydraulic jack. It's like a little jack that you um, uh, mount the injector on, and the little jack actually uh, pressurizes the injector to uh, thousands of PSI, which is what you need um, uh, to be able to test these things properly, okay? You can test it with lower pressures, but uh, it's not very, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't yield good results. You also have an offset uh, button knob in there on the uh, uh, left-hand side, and that's pretty much, it controls the uh, output uh, to the oscilloscope. It also has an output, and it's a BNC uh, connected to the oscilloscope that you can actually graph or view the waveform of the injector in question. And this is very useful. And following, we're going to see uh, how this looks uh, on the on screen in the, in the oscilloscope. And this is the uh, injector waveform that you can actually see. Um, uh, again, these injectors, this particular waveform, it's important. Uh, it looks like a slanted uh, uh, waveform. Uh, half of it is uh, injector open, and the other half is injector closed. These injectors need a pulse to open and another pulse to close okay and as you can see on screen uh, this is exactly what we're getting with this unit this 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 unit mimics exactly what you get from factory okay so anyhow uh this is our injector test so we basically briefly we covered on this video how these injectors operate uh you need to put some pressure on them again uh, they're high voltage, about 100 volts, anywhere between 90 to 110 volts. Uh, our unit will give you that exactly. Uh, and basically, once you have that, then you can actually use the, the you know, either you use the tester in the car uh, by pressurizing the, the system, or you test it with that, um, with our unit and a, a form of a high pressure source that you, uh, and the cheapest way to do that is just to uh, purchase that the little hydraulic jack, pressure jack that you get. And you can get it from anywhere, pretty much Amazon, whatever you want, okay? So this is it. Uh, we'd like to thank you for tuning in to our video, uh, to our videos uh, on our channel ADP Training here on YouTube. And go to our website, autodiagnosticsandpublishing.com. Uh, you can also get this unit if you want from, the, from our website. We make, we manufacture, we design this unit. Uh, if you need the, uh, another GDI, the magnetic one which is a lower voltage unit you can also get it from our, our website so anyhow we'd like to thank you for tuning in into our channel uh, adp training and thank you for watching okay so the uh, gdi magnetic injector tester it's a uh, tool with uh, a couple of functions that are worth noting now the following controls are, are, are worth some notice. Uh, as you can see on screen, uh, we have uh, the button and the switch right below the button. This button, it's a uh, pretty much is an on and off. It is a very uh, exacting way to pulsate the uh, injectors. That way you can uh, pretty much go into uh, specific uh, timings of the uh, injector leak down, especially when you're doing a leak down testing. So uh, when uh, using the button in 
particular, not the switch, the button, you pretty much say to yourself, okay, so I'm going to do a leak down for maybe uh, 10, 15 seconds, 20 seconds. That's pretty typical. Uh, and so you would use the button, not the switch. Uh, so the switch is pretty much uh, an on and off just to pulsate the injector on all the time or just leave it off. Uh, if you're going to use the button, then, then the switch has to be off uh, pretty much. Uh, next, as uh, uh, we've said before, you have the switch. The switch is an on and off deal. It's pretty much on or off. If you use the switch, you don't use the button, and the switch is there uh, for rebuilders, um, for long, for testing over long periods of time. We, um, as a matter of fact, when, when designing the, the unit, we left the switch on uh, with an injector for uh, almost a month. Uh, non-stop just to see what would happen uh, and if to see if the unit would take it and it would pretty much on, on the money you know so this thing uh, can take a lot of heat uh, as, as far as testing uh, and it is also uh, a very good tool for uh, rebuilders next is the uh, se uh, the 700 uh, the, the pulse width switch which is 700 microseconds and 2 milliseconds this is a switch it's a very straightforward control uh, if you set it on the 2 millisecond uh, setting, uh, it'll do a 2 millisecond uh, a pulse width. Uh, this is meant for long-term testing, and if you want to do a leak down uh, of the injector, um, of the depending on the type of, type of injector that you have, uh, 700 microseconds would be a more exact uh, leak down test, uh, meaning that the injector is going to open and close um, a lot faster. And remember, this is also a pulse width modulated uh, control. That's the way uh, GDI direct injectors are now controlled. Uh, in this particular case, this is the magnetic unit uh, for magnetic injectors. GDI injectors, they operate at uh, anywhere between uh, 45 to uh, 60 volts. Uh, so again, this is the pulse width switch. Uh, if you set it to the 700 microseconds, that's when you use the button. Uh, and you do a leak down test for a specific period of time, uh, 5, 10, uh, 15, 20 uh, seconds, and you pretty much can determine if you have a clogged injector. The next control is pretty much pretty straightforward. Is the voltage adjustment? Uh, this is uh, where you adjust the voltage. It, it'll go from roughly 15 volts to 60, 62, 65 volts. Um, so you don't really need um, an exact voltage as far as uh, to test the injector. Uh, you, you need a ballpark figure, and this is you're talking about right around anywhere between 50 and 60 volts is fine. A lot of these injectors don't do not pulsate at the at they, they don't all pulsate at the exact same voltage. So you'd have some densos uh, pulsating at uh, at 50 volts, and some of them are, are at 60. Uh, it doesn't really matter. The reason why this adjustment uh, was instituted in this particular tool uh, is because some of the uh, uh, GDI fuel pumps. Uh, this is the fuel pump, the high-pressure fuel pump, the one that's uh, driven by the cam, uh, right at the, uh, in the at the engine, at the um, at the fuel rail. Uh, some of them have a um, uh, the valve that's on top of the uh, fuel pump operate at at around 18 to 25 volts. So we said, you know, it's, since we're making the the, the unit, uh, why not uh, just make the uh, adjustment uh, uh, for the voltage a variable? And this is why we came up with a uh, variable voltage uh, adjustment for the uh, GDI uh, injector uh, tester. And finally, we're going to show you a specific control that's found only on the PLUS uh, unit. Uh, the GDI um, injector tester uh, comes in two forms, the regular one uh, and the uh, PLUS version of the unit. The offset um, control that you see here it's pretty much uh, it works for the built-in uh, current probe uh, that's inside the unit 
this particular unit, the plus section had the, pl the plus version has two specific uh, circuitry inside. One is for voltage. Uh, there's a 10 to 1 attenuator probe in there. Remember, this is high voltage, so you don't want to put high voltage into your scope just like that. It's okay if you know what you're doing, uh, but if not, there is a, a 10 to 1 attenuator. Uh, this pretty much drops down the voltage inside uh, the output for the uh, for, for the oscilloscope or your multimeter. Uh, pretty much a, a graphing multimeter and, and a scope is what's usually used with this unit, with the plus unit. And so, but there's another uh, extra circuit in, inside, and it's a uh, complete um, current probe. Uh, this particular offset uh, control, it's uh, it allows you to uh, center. Uh, the uh, current uh, waveform uh, so that uh, you don't see any clippings on top or, or the bottom of the waveform. That way you could see uh, the injector pintle opening and closing and uh, a bunch of, of, of uh, characteristi characteristics about the injectors that are very, very useful uh, when diagnosing uh, not only uh, GDI injectors but the old-fashioned, the old-timers as well, the uh, multi-port uh, injection uh, systems. So this, um, uh, the plus unit has a built-in 10 to 1 attenuator and also a current probe. Uh, and the offset uh, um, control is for the current side so that you can adjust uh, the clippings on top of pretty much the amplitude of, of the waveform. We hope you enjoyed this video uh, about this vers versatile uh, GDI direct injection tester. Following, uh, we can see the uh, GDI Magnetic Injector Pulser Tester. Um, in this video, we're going to concentrate on analyzing the uh, actual injector current waveform. Um, there is a, a difference between in injector uh, current waveform and voltage waveform. Uh, generally speaking, uh, voltage waveform is used by to denote uh, the uh, uh, ECM uh, driver uh, circuit. Uh, and and what the ECM is doing to the injector. That's what the voltage side is used for. The current side is used to actually test uh, the injector uh, itself, the, the general mechanical condition of the uh, actual GDI injector. G the GDI injector, injector tester can also be used to test the, uh, the, the solenoid on top of the pump, uh, which goes on the rail. Uh, so it that hence is the, the voltage is variable from about 15 to 60 volts to be able to test this particular pump. So now let's uh, let's just uh, on screen we can actually see uh, the injector uh, voltage uh, output signal. This is exactly what it looks like from the 10, 10 to 1 attenuation. You don't want to put a uh, high voltage into the uh, uh, into your oscilloscope. So hence uh, the, the unit has a an attenuator that drops down the voltage from uh, whatever voltage you're using, say 60 volts, drops it down to a manageable voltage so that you don't burn the unit. Uh, you don't have to, but it's all, always a good idea not to deal with the high voltage uh, directly. As you can see, the first part of the wave, it's the, uh, that slanted line that goes, it's like a spike that goes up. Uh, that's the magnetic field buildup. Uh, this particular line uh, denotes uh, shorted injector coil windings. It has to reach the upper, the peak of the of uh, of this particular part of the wave has to reach maximum voltage. So if you're using 55 volts, you have to see 55 volts all the way at the at the tip of the uh, of this particular wave. Uh, following the the tip of the wave is the uh, the injector hold time. Okay, uh, and this it looks different than the uh, than the voltage uh, waveform. Precisely because on the voltage side you would see the the, the signal switching uh, up and down, and this is how these type of injectors are connected. These uh, the the resistance for uh, GDI injectors is very low. Uh, we're talking two ohms, two and a half ohms. So don't ever jump one of these injectors to power and ground uh, just to see if they trigger. Uh, you would burn the injector almost immediately. So you got to be very careful uh, not to do that. These are PWM control injectors. Uh, the actual hold time, it's uh, it's fast switched, hence uh, PWM, uh, pulse width modulation, okay? Now, uh, the next part of the wave, it's the uh, inject the commanded injector turn off uh, spot on, on, on the wave. 
and this is pretty much what you would see it correlates with whatever you're getting on the voltage side and this is the ECM uh, turn off spot this is the actual uh, electrical turn off it doesn't correspond with the actual uh, physical turning off of the injector that spot is a little bit further you know to the to the right of the uh, waveform and this is the uh, the little tiny hump that you see there is the physical pintle closing hump and uh, you would see that on the injector side uh, I'm sorry on the uh, current side uh, because this particular spot denotes um, injector pintle closing if this spot were to uh, be further to the right it would indicate weak springs uh, because it take, just takes too long, will be taking too long for the injector to close. We're talking about milliseconds here and sometimes microseconds on these injectors. Uh, but however, it, it's important. These injectors are, you know, they're more exacting than the old uh, multi-port injection uh, systems, uh, injectors. So again, uh, if this part were to be a little bit further to the, uh, uh, to the left, for example, now you're talking about a semi-clogged injector because it's just closing too fast uh, if, if why is it closing too fast imagine if it's uh, if the injector is semi-clogged there's no resistance uh, on the fuel side so it would the pinto would simply shut off you know almost immediately so you would see that on the uh, current waveform that's the only way to see it there's no other way to see uh, the, uh, the, to, to get ascertain the general mechanical health of the injector again uh, our particular unit uh, outputs both a, a voltage output and a current uh, output uh, from the uh, uh, the plus uh, version of the unit. Uh, this is pretty much all you're going to have. Uh, you're going to need uh, to be able to test this unit in the field. GDI Nox Catalyst Operation Newer GDI injected lean burn engines operate under a different set of conditions. In normal PFI injection, the mixture is always alternating between rich and lean in what's called a closed loop operation. This principle goes very well with the traditional three-way catalytic converter, where oxygen is stored and released during closed-loop operation to burn off the excess hydrocarbons and carbon monoxide. However, the newer GDI stratified lean burn engines operate under a lean state, with an air-fuel ratio or wide-band sensor, maintaining the lean condition for fairly long periods of time. This lean O2 rich environment and the higher compression ratios create NOx and the conventional three-way catalytic converter is not able to reduce NOx under these circumstances. Therefore, new catalytic systems had to be developed. Among the best approaches is the so-called NOx storage reduction or NSR catalyst, along with mixed lean or closed loop combustion. During the long lean periods, NOx is stored on a storage catalytic converter, using platinum, palladium and rhodium. As the NOx storage component gets saturated, the catalyst needs to be regenerated. This is done during short rich operation of the engine resulting in an oxygen efficient exhaust. Consequently, the stored NOx is released and reduced over noble metals as mentioned before, into the harmless N2 or nitrogen 2. It is crucial to understand the NSR mechanism in order to be able to diagnose a vehicle properly. From now on, you, as a technician will be faced with a series of DTC or diagnostic trouble codes never seen before, such as exhaust temperature, NOx catalyst and nitrogen oxide faulty codes. The NOx storage catalytic converter stores nitrogen in its porous ceramic layers, which is a substrate, a wash coat and a series of noble catalyst metals such as platinum, palladium and rhodium. As the level of NOx or nitrogen oxide increases, the ability to further absorb nitrogen oxide declines. 
after a specific level of nitrogen oxide absorption, it is then necessary to regenerate the NOx catalytic converter. In reality what happens is that the stored NOx is removed and reduced using excess hydrocarbons on a momentarily rich mixture, and a chemical process, thereby, reducing NOx to harmless NO2. At the same time, the NOx substrate is now free to reabsorb the new lean burn ox that will be created. It is also important to know that GDI engines also still employ the traditional three-way catalytic converter of old, to reduce HC and CO, which works the same as it always has. What changes here is the addition of an exhaust temperature sensor, in between the three-way converter and the NOx catalyst, a momentary rich fuel injection program to regenerate the NOx catalyst or should we say to remove the stored NOx, and on some engines a third wideband RF fuel ration sensor, which may even be called a NOx sensor. The extra AFR sensor after the NOx catalyst is monitored by the ECM which every so often, when it is informed that the NOx catalyst is saturated by the after NOx converter sensor, goes into a temporarily rich condition called lambda less than 1. The resulting rich mixture, as usual, generates excess HC and CO, which quantities the three-way converter can't reduce, and then remove and combine with the stored NOx in the NOx catalyst. An issue of the NOx catalyst will illuminate the check engine light. The ECM is constantly evaluating the after NOx sensor, and comparing it to a pre-programmed new NOx catalyst model. If after regeneration, a deviation threshold is reached, the check engine light will illuminate and a code will set in memory. DTC codes associated with the NOx catalyst are, for Honda, DTC P1420, Ford P164A, and the P0400 series codes. Also, understand that with GDI technology, which employs lean burning mixtures by definition, the old menace vacuum leak is now the big menace vacuum leak. Making the mixture lean all the time. Even when the ECM tries to regenerate the NOx catalyst by creating a temporarily rich mixture, will flag an erroneous NOx converter code and illuminate the check engine light. An issue with the air injection system will also have a nasty effect on the NOx regeneration. Simply put, with GDI and NOx reduction technology, the little issues with vacuum and lean mixtures become amplified and can definitely skew your diagnostic conclusion. GDI NOx Catalyst Regeneration the GD Inox storage catalyst is in charge of removing, storing and then reducing the output of nitrogen oxides, also called NOx. GDI engines, due to their higher compression ratios, do produce a higher amount of NOx. It is for this reason that after a specific period of time, the NOx catalyst becomes saturated and can no longer absorb any NOx. The ECM looks at the NOx sensor to determine the efficiency of it. Also, the ECM by definition, has to employ a NOx regeneration fuel injection program to remove and clean the stored NOx. If the regeneration program fails, the ECM will detect it by monitoring the NOx sensor, turn the check engine light on, and issue a faulty code. The NOx catalyst regeneration process happened in the following way. It has been found in extensive laboratory testing that the NOx catalyst may go for as long as 65 minutes before completely filling up. At which time, the NOx intake will resemble the NOx output. Regeneration is achieved during cruise speeds. At cruise and steady operation, 
the ECM momentarily switches from stratified mode, also called lean burn, to homogeneous mode, which is normal closed loop mode that we know of in PFI injection. During homogeneous mode, which we'll call regular closed loop, the ECM makes a series of sudden rich mixture injection events to enrich the mixture. The idea is to create an excess of CO and HC, known as hydrocarbons and carbon monoxide. Anything that interferes with this temporary rich injection will render the regeneration meaningless. So, for this reason, any illegal lean condition, like vacuum leaks, faulty air injection system, and even a bad mass airflow sensor that makes the engine run lean, will cause trouble. As soon as the air-fuel mixture turns rich, the excess CO and HC molecules are attracted to the stored NOx, and are changed by a catalyst process which takes place with the platinum and other noble metals in the converter. The resulting exhaust is a harmless NO2 or nitrogen 2 gas. Ideally, for all this to work, the main fuel injection system has to operate flawlessly, and like any other catalyst, a big enemy is silicone contamination, which coats the catalyst substrate and renders it useless. In retrospect, always beware of vacuum leaks and lean faulty codes when diagnosing NOx catalyst problems, because one affects the other. GDI NOx Catalyst Testing On GDI systems there is a NOx sensor to the rear of the NOx Catalyst storage device. The NOx sensor is derived from wideband RF fuel ratio sensor technology. It uses two internal chambers, one as a reference and the other to do the actual measurement. Because these devices are sensitive, their actual currents are on the milliamp range, it is not practical to do a voltage or current reading directly. Most digital multimeters or oscilloscopes will have difficulty measuring these low current values, necessitating the use of costly lab equipment out of range to automotive personnel. In fact, some NOx sensors are sold with a control box that is in turn attached to the ECM. Be advised that when diagnosing NOx related issues, a reliance on a generic scan tool is needed. You do not need a factory scanner to diagnose NOx catalyst issues. All NOx scanner PID parameters are now part of OBD2 generic. The NOx parameter can be reported in percentages and also in milliamps range current parameter. It may also be reported as a normalized 0 to 1 volt parameter, just like a normal O2 sensor. All these values are calculated by the ECM and not direct measurements, which are almost impossible to get. When faced with a NOx catalyst faulty code, a few things have to be done first. One, is to query the ACM for any NOx related codes. In order to weed out possible erroneous codes, you need to make sure the NOx sensor is fine. Two, you must do a NOx sensor response test to double check its operation. The problem, is that you may still have a faulty NOx sensor and the ECM hasn't really picked up on it yet. To do an NOx response test, you simply operate the engine in its NOx producing window, and with a lean mixture. Just do a preload test by setting the vehicle in gear, applying the brakes, and lightly pressing on the accelerator. Also, create a vacuum leak to run the mixture lean. Be sure to erase any codes that may set afterwards. We're assuming that access to a dyno is non-existent, otherwise you may use a dyno to stress the engine. After a few seconds of preloading the engine on a lean mixture, the production of NOx is assured. 
At this time you will see the NOx catalyst get saturated with NOx or oxides of nitrogen. Then, remove the created vacuum leak and run the engine rich, by introducing some propane at the air intake. At this time, with the added propane fuel, raise the engine revolutions to 2000 rpm to regenerate the converter. The rich mixture, as we've explained on the catalyst regeneration segment, will purge it from stored NOx and combine it to the rich HC and CO to produce N2 or harmless nitrogen gas. Then, remove the propane gas from the air intake and do a final preload of the engine. Throughout this procedure, assuming the converter is good, you will see a rise in NOx production and then a definite decrease, signaling that the NOx sensor is operational. Even if the NOx catalyst is faulty, the NOx value will change dramatically as the procedure is being done. In the event that a NOx catalyst code was set in memory, and all the before mentioned procedure has flagged the NOx sensor as good, simply replace the NOx catalyst. Keep in mind that for the NOx catalyst code to have set, ECM would have seen a failing NOx catalyst at least more than four times. All throughout the procedure, the idea is to make sure the rear NOx sensor is operational and then, faced with a catalyst code, arrive at the final decision to replace the NOx catalyst. Unnecessary parts replacement, especially on an expensive unit like this, is simply not an option. NOx Sensor Operation NOx sensors represent state-of-the-art technology that is applied to gasoline lean burn engines, as part of an engine control and diagnostic system, used to ensure proper operation of the NOx emission control system. These sensors can be incorporated, independent of the NOx emission control technology used on the vehicle, and their function is primarily to monitor the NOx conversion efficiency and regeneration of the catalyst material. The sensors can work as part of a feedback to the ECM, and to make real-time adjustments to the NOx regeneration using a momentary 3 to 10 seconds rich mixture. The principle of operation of the NOx sensor is based on proven solid-state technology developed for oxygen or wide-band sensors. The dual chambers zirconium sensing element and electrochemical pumps, work in conjunction with precious metals electrodes, to control the oxygen concentration within the sensor chambers and then convert the NOx to nitrogen. The sensor sends an output voltage signal that is directly proportional to the NOx concentration. The NOx sensor can be incorporated upstream and downstream of the catalyst, to provide a feedback control loop to the ECM, indicative of the emissions system. Most vehicles have only enough to convert a sensor. The ECM can then make adjustments to optimize NOx conversion performance, and during the regeneration process. In general, the measurement of NOx consists of the following. First, the NOx sensor lowers the oxygen concentration of a measurement sample in the first cavity chamber, by means of an electron flow pump, where the flow of electrons makes for a tiny pump action. In this first cavity chamber, once it is void of O2, the NOx will not decompose, because of the lack of oxygen. Second, the oxygen concentration is further reduced to specific level in the second cavity chamber, for that same measurement sample, which is then decomposed on top of a special measuring electrode, releasing the stored oxygen. The decomposed NOx released oxygen is detected as an outputted current and voltage signal, which is usually modified by the NOx sensor control box, if applicable. This simple description clearly shows you the importance of keeping the exhaust void of oil and silicone contamination, so as not to destroy both, the catalyst material and the NOx sensor itself. So, 
The first internal cavity chamber sucks in an exhaust sample, using chamber 1 pumping cell and sensing circuit. The purple, IP1 plus pumping cell, is seen here to the left. The IP1 plus and minus are platinum and gold electrodes, which force out the oxygen of the NOx to be measured. The sensing of the oxygen consists of IP- and the sensing electrode in light blue-green to the bottom. The first and second cavity chambers connect through the middle diffusion path. There's also a pumping cell called IP2 plus and measurement electrode versus plus, and a measurement electrode dark blue, in the second cavity chamber. These electrodes are also made of platinum and gold. Again, electromotive force is what pumps out the oxygen in these tiny chambers, to finally arrive at a measurable amount. The measurement electrode does a decomposition of the NOx, using a small catalytic activity. Therefore, the NOx decomposes as it enters the second cavity chamber, and the resulting oxygen extracted from the NOx is the actual measurement of the amount of NOx in the exhaust. So, the first chamber pumps out the oxygen, and the second chamber decomposes the resulting NOx, and then pumps out and measures, the oxygen extracted from the NOx mixture. Clearly then the NOx sensor is really an oxygen sensor that has been designed to decompose NOx and measure its resulting oxygen content. All this technical explanation points out a few things to remember when replacing a GDI NOx sensor, and what to do to avoid damage. For one, the early NOx sensors had issues with the control box that usually accompanies these sensors. Moisture was a major issue for both the box and the sensor itself. For anyone confronting a repeated NOx sensor replacement issue, there is a big chance that the ECM needs a reflashing procedure, which reinstalls a modified fuel program that occasionally purges out excess moisture in the system. Also, given that these sensors are made more critical than regular O2 sensors, the biggest enemy is always silicone contamination. For this reason, avoid any silicone glue at the intake manifold air duct gasket. Silicone is fine for water passages, but not air. And finally, remember what we've mentioned in our other segment, about using a catch can on the PCV system to trap all oil residue, both for the sake of eliminating valve carbon and for any oil to be released to the exhaust. Whatever happens when these engines reach over 100,000 miles and start to burn oil is anyone's guess. But, keep in mind that engines are now lasting longer than ever, and the use of clean fuel is due to rise precisely for all these reasons. GDI NOx sensor testing. The nitrogen oxide sensor, also referred to as the NOx sensor, consists of a sensor and the associated control unit. The two parts cannot be separated. The control unit of the nitrogen oxide sensor communicates with the engine management system across a CAN network, or controller area network. In early GDI systems, the NOx sensor didn't necessarily have a control box attached to it. However, when it comes to NOx sensors, there are very few manufacturers dedicated to making them. Most NOx sensors are made by NGK Continental, with NGK making the sensor itself and Continental doing the electronic control module. This sensor is also called the UniNOx sensor by VDO for European cars. The NOx sensor, as mentioned before, is sold as a standalone unit with the control box attached to the sensor. These are matched bare, and the control box or module is pre-programmed with the characteristics of that particular NOx sensor. The sensor and box does the following. 
regeneration of NOx storage catalyst on lean burn gasoline GDI cycle. Onboard diagnosis of the NOx sensor itself, including the heater control. Based upon the physical measurement, the electronic control unit generates three output signals, which are NOx concentration, binary lambda and linear lambda voltage signals. So, in essence, this sensor provides a dual value for both NOx and as a regular AFR or air fuel ratio sensor. This means that the NOx sensor also serves as the after catalytic converter sensor to also diagnose the operation of the three way catalytic converter found before the NOx catalyst. The signals are sent to the engine ECM digitally by way of the CAN bus network. This sensor has six wires attached to the control module and the module has at least four wires linked to the ECM. The six wires are as follows. The heater element plus and the heater element minus. These two wires are duty cycle controlled by the control box to maintain a constant NOx sensor temperature. The IP1 plus wire, which controls the first diffusion chamber, the IP2 plus wire which then controls the second diffusion chamber, signaling the NOx concentrations. The voltage out plus, which signals the O2 concentration, and works like a normal AFR or wideband sensor, but not like the older O2 sensor. This wire indicates to the control box the amount of oxygen in the exhaust. Finally the IP and voltage ground for all the before mentioned wires. The control module has a few functions, which are to receive all these electronic signals, digitize the signals and then convert the entire stream into a CAN J1939 or controller area network data stream. The ECM doesn't actually receives a point-to-point -point direct connection. The ECM gets a series of digital signals from the NOx control box and then separates, tabulates and makes the appropriate decisions regarding fuel injection. The NOx controller also has a two-way communication with the ECM for diagnostic purposes. In other words, the ECM can ask the NOx box for information of the health of the sensor and the heater element. Finally. The NOx controller also controls the heater element of the NOx sensor. Testing the NOx sensor is done, entirely using the scan tool. It is important to know that these are OBD2 regulated parameters, and a generic OBD2 scanner is all you need to diagnose this system. Even if you had a factory tool, you'd probably have to go back and access the generic data stream for NOx sensor values. To test the NOx involves simply monitoring the NOx scanner data, accessing codes, goosing the throttle and then forcing the mixture rich using propane, or lean, by creating a vacuum leak, to check for NOx and O2 response values. Remember, just because you have a high NOx or low O2 response code doesn't mean that the sensor is faulty. Testing of this NOx sensor is therefore similar to that of the wideband AFR02 sensor, and also using a bit of ingenuity on your part. Experience and practice pays off in the end. Hello everybody and welcome to another video. In this video, we're going to go uh, a little deep into testing a piezo injector, which is um, an injector found on, on gas or petrol and diesel vehicles. We're also going to delve a little bit into analyzing the uh, injector waveform uh, so that you can ascertain uh, or have an idea uh, if uh, the one, if the ECM is triggering the injector properly and two, if the injector itself is shot. Now, as you can see on screen, uh, these injectors take a bunch of different forms, but they're usually uh, longer than the uh, than the other type of injector, of direct injector. Uh, the other type being the uh, magnetic direct injector. Uh, so these injectors are uh, normally 
uh, again, they're found on, on gas, gasoline, and diesel vehicles, and they're uh, they're a little bit sturdier uh, because of the high pressures. Some piezo injectors are are meant to uh, operate um, at about uh, 3,000 psi. Now, one thing about these injectors is that they are composed of a crystal stack. Uh, and by the way, if you're testing this injector with a puppet, one of those puppet pressurizers, uh, they won't really uh, inject anything below 400 uh, PSI. So make sure you're above the 400 PSI mark. This piece of information comes from, from a bunch of, uh, of my customers who purchased my unit, which we're gonna show also on, the, in, on this video. Uh, they don't really, uh, and I'll, I'll explain why in, in this next uh, uh, um, a shot here. Uh, these injectors are not the pintle or the needle of the injector it doesn't directly uh, actuate the big needle, which is the one that actually injects. So these guys are, uh, what they do is they uh, manipulate a small, tiny chamber that you see here. Uh, this tiny chamber is, is the one that hydraulically um, uh, actuates the actual injector pintle. So because of that reason, when you're testing these injectors, uh, they don't uh, uh, function properly at low PSI values. Anything below six to four to six hundred uh, PSI, they don't they don't really like it. Uh, so it doesn't. It depends on the manufacturer, of course. But then, you know, below four hundred, you're not going to get anything out of it. Or you may also get uh, a bunch of fuel coming out of it without any. Uh, you're going to think that the injector is faulty, but it's not. So don't test these injectors at low uh, PSI uh, values. Now, very quick, quickly, we're not going to go deep into this, into the actual circuitry that drives the injectors. Uh, this is more of, a, of an engineering uh, uh, subject, but we briefly, we're going to just going to tell you one thing. Uh, these injectors and also the magnetic injectors, they operate differently than the old timer um, uh, multi-port fuel injection uh, components. So these guys have two transistors, one that actually, they're triggered uh, on, on both legs uh, of, the, uh, of the actual injector. So it's not like you have positive steady uh, uh, 12 volts going in and then the, the negative side pulses, that it doesn't operate, it doesn't work that way. Both sides uh, actually uh, operate uh, the injector. So one side, as you can see here on screen, is the selector uh, transistor, uh, FET, meaning field effect transistor. And then the other transistor is the actual uh, PWM, uh, which is the one that actually pulsates. In other words, the negative side turns on and the, and the, uh, and the positive side pulsates. So both sides, uh, the injector is controlled by both sides. Now later on in this, this video, we're gonna show you the injector actuating, but briefly we're just gonna, um, uh, going to the actual waveform of the, of the uh, current waveform of the injector. And as you can see on screen, this is the pulse width of the injector. It's, it's like a big hump. Uh, it's not a regular hump. It's a, it's a piezo injector hump, current hump. Okay. So um, if you look at the, uh, at the um, uh, pulse width, uh, it stays at 65 uh, microseconds. Uh, injector pulse width are very, very, very narrow. Just letting you know. In this particular case, we are testing at 65 microseconds, and you're going to see the injector uh, going faster or slower. But that's just the pulsation, the RPM, uh, that's actually being uh, manipulated, not necessarily the the pulse width. Okay. And uh, next, you can, as you can see on the on screen, is the the current waveform. We're going to divide it in half. We split it in half. The green side is the charging side, which is the opening side of the injector, and the red uh, half of the hump is the discharge side, which is the closing part of the injector. These injectors have to be charged and discharged, as you can see right now uh, on screen. So piezo injectors have to be charged and discharged. In the uh, early days of uh, direct injection, uh, there, there wasn't a resistor uh, in between the, the two terminals. Uh, nowadays, they, they include a, like a 10 ohm uh, uh, 
a 10k ohm resistor so that the injector actually discharges in the event that it gets disconnected or the ECM uh, driver goes bad so it doesn't stay open so in the old days the injector would actually charge and if, if there was an issue or you disconnected the injector it would just stay uh, uh, squirting in a fuel into the uh, into the combustion chamber and so basically what they did they just added a resistor uh, across the terminals so that the injector actually if they if it gets disconnected it gets discharged now as you can see on screen uh, we're showing you uh, the actual uh, injector uh, and of course the um, uh, piso direct injector tester unit that we have on our website autodiagnosticsandpublishing.com uh, this uh, unit was uh, uh, developed and uh, designed and developed and manufactured by us uh, we we spent almost two years trying to do the, the unit and it's, it's a very it's a very straightforward strong tough unit you have a uh, two switches there, one for the pulse width. Uh, actually, the pulse width stays the same. Again, around 65 microseconds. It's just, it just changes the RPM. Uh, and so you have a steady uh, switch and you have a button. Uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, you can actually control the voltage, which is nice about this unit, uh, that you can control the voltage and you can actually control the output uh, because the unit also has a voltage uh, waveform output for the oscilloscope. This is actually we're doing we're testing now with a current a clamp on a current amp probe as you can see on screen you can clamp it around either the positive or the negative doesn't really matter it's just you're going to see the hump upside down in this particular case that's a hump the live hump that that, that produce that's produced by the uh, current uh, and again as we explained before uh, basically what it is it's a charging and discharging of the uh, of the actual injector uh, it's very important that you understand this because it's, it'll help you uh, determine if you have an issue with the injector itself. Uh, if this hump is not right or if you only see half of it and all of a sudden you see a cut, uh, it could be either the uh, ECM driver is shot uh, because he cannot discharge the injector uh, or the, uh, the injector itself. The injector itself, it's uh, uh, faulty. So the basic understanding here is that if you understand what this waveform means, uh, this is the only the current waveform. Uh, the, the unit also outputs a, a voltage waveform, which you can actually see right now superimposed uh, on this particular, the, on these two charts that, that, we, uh, that I created for you. Uh, it is actually uh, the traces on the background. If you look at it, and it, it looks a little different, uh, but it, it means the same. It actually is a, it's a charge and discharge cycle of a piezo injector. If anything is wrong, if anything is different than this, then you have an issue. Now, uh, if for whatever reason the injector itself is shot, the waveform is the amplitude is not going to be as 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 high as this one uh, because it's just not. You know, oftentimes what you what you get is the uh, uh, the crystal stack gets faulty, uh, and you're not going to see a, a a big hump like this. Okay. Uh, and so at that point in time what you do it's uh, basically you know that the injector has to be replaced because, or you have to um, um, rebuild the injector which, which they are rebuildable they sell the, uh, the crystal stacks uh, by themselves so anyhow so you, you could do that just replace it it takes a little bit of know-how uh, not everybody knows how to do it but you can do it okay or you could also have issues with um, the discharge cycle and you would need uh, to look at the voltage uh, waveform 2 on the background here and you would see that it if it charges but it doesn't discharge there might be a problem with the one of the driver transistor drivers inside the ECM uh, not very common usually when that happens you would not get a pulsation whatsoever um, uh, so you know it's it, but, but a lot of the, the, there could be a bunch of different scenarios you know uh, it could be that you have resistance in the in the wiring. You could have resistance in the uh, relay that powers the uh, uh, one of the one side of the uh, of the ECM. You could have a ground problem. Uh, so a bunch of different scenarios are possible, and it'll reflect on this waveform. And you're not going to see what you see right now. You're going to see something else. Usually a lower amplitude a hump. 
uh, as if, and it's the same that what happens when you actually lower the voltage with this particular unit, you're going to see the, the, the hump uh, goes up and down. Um, you, and basically that's exactly what happens you know, when you have a, an issue with the, with the resistive uh, uh, component on, on the wiring or, or, or the ECM itself. Again, we'd like to thank you for tuning into our channel on, on YouTube, ADP Training. Uh, also, subscribe to not only to our channel, ADP Training, but also on our website, um, autodiagnosticsandpublishing.com. Uh, we're always giving out a bunch of free stuff, free books, e-books, uh, audio books, you name it. So, subscribe to our, web, to, to our channel and to our website. Uh, we'd like to thank you for tuning in to uh, our channel uh, where we show everything automotive usually high-tech stuff, you know, relating to automotive, automotive te technology. Uh, anyhow, so we'd like to thank you and uh, thank you for watching. GDI pressure control solenoid. The newer GDI gasoline direct injection engines employ a very tight control of the high pressure fuel pump by regulating the fuel pressure and volume solenoid. This solenoid is built into the high pressure pump. The ECM uses various sensor readings and the fuel pressure sensor value to control the pressure solenoid valve. Due to the high pressures seen on GDI engines, at around 2900 psi, the electrical control of this solenoid also has to follow suit. The GDI fuel pressure solenoid is controlled by a heavy ECM driver and a peak and hold signal current. Peak and hold was used in the past on dual throttle body injectors. It is a control scheme that uses an initial high surge of current to click open the solenoid, then a lower current to maintain the solenoid pintle open. This scheme can be employed using on-off signaling or a duty cycle control. The idea is to actuate the fuel pressure control solenoid at a specific camshaft degree value of rotation. The later the solenoid is actuated the less pressure delivered by the high pressure GDI fuel pump. As long as the solenoid is open, fuel is returned back to the fuel inlet and no pressure rise is seen. The use of a peak and hold control signal is understandable and also doesn't put any extra time in the learning curve associated with diagnosing these systems. Technician and DIY mechanics should dig back into the diagnostic procedures for the older large peak and hold injectors of the past to gain an insight into repairing these systems. GDI pressure sensor testing. Normal PFI or port fuel injection pressures maximum range almost never will exceed 75 psi. On GDI the nominal fuel pressure is usually about 2900 psi. These high pressure will naturally employ fuel components that are much more roughed in construction. Common rail direct injection pressure measurements can be made with a robust thin film titanium oxynitride pressure transducer architecture. Hermetically sealed, all welded stainless steel construction is used, and a variety of port and electrical connector options is employed, satisfying specific manufacturers. Other GDI fuel pressure sensors employ advanced crystalline silicon MEMS strain gauge technology. MEMS are related to semiconductors and integrated circuits, originally based on silicon wafer fabrication techniques, but adding space, and continuously variable output similar to analog devices. This type of technology, although started back in the 60s, was too difficult to manufacture, but now highly reliable in high-pressure applications. Some of the key advantages of MEMS are 
ability to miniaturize physical aspects to nearly the same degree as integrated microchips. Reduction of the sample size of matter being measured, in this case pressure. Ability to integrate sensing, analysis and response in a small package. MEMS pressure sensors are a specific fabrication technology, with an effect on the GDI diagnosis of components. Whichever technology is used to manufacture the fuel pressure sensor, the output will be the same and the same goes for the supporting ECM circuitry. The GDI fuel pressure sensor has three terminals, the voltage reference, the sensor signal output and the sensor ground. This arrangement is similar to most sensors made within the last few years. The difference here is pressure and care should be taken for safety reasons. To do a voltage signal sweep test, you will need some way to slowly relieve the high pressure from the fuel rail. One easy and quick way is to use a GDI injector pulser. Most GDI injectors are not the piezoelectric type, so a GDI pulser is similar, but not necessarily the same as a conventional PFI pulser. Connect a graphing multimeter or scope to the signal wire and to the ground terminal. Disable all GDI injectors by disconnecting the main injector connector, then crank the engine to build up the high pressure. At this time the GDI fuel pressure sensor should be around maximum reference voltage of 5 volts. Somewhere about 4.8 volts should be fine, since it'll never be exactly 5 volts. At this point check that the fuel pressure sensor is stable. If not, then there's a pressure loss and the high pressure pump should be looked at or replaced. Then, connect the injector pulser to one of the injectors. Proceed to pulse the injectors at the lowest setting possible, which is usually around 5 to 10 milliseconds. This will allow for a slow high pressure decay, which a scope or graphing meter can accurately graph. The issue with fuel pressure sensors are the blind spots that don't necessarily cause a code, but definitely a performance problem. At this time, if the output has no sudden drops or blind spots the sensor is fine. Manufacturers do thrive to make these sensor output fairly linear, but this is rarely the case. You should at least have a smooth signal curve with no sudden drops. Minimum voltage is normally about 0.2 and maximum about 4.8 volts. Remember that there are always stray resistance values and residual pressures that make it impossible for 0 or 5 volts to be seen. There are other ways to relieve the high pressure, but they involve cracking the high pressure line open, which carries some dangers to it. This is by far the fastest, safer and easier way to perform a fuel pressure decay test. GDI Spray Guided Combustion Spray Guided Combustion is the cornerstone of lean burning gasoline direct injection or GDI engines. The GDI Spray Guided Burn concept is characterized by fuel being injected directly into the spark plug, with all the vaporization happening on the spot. Fuel economy has become the major development driver for new engines for passenger cars and light duty vehicles worldwide. Gasoline vehicles still dominate the market, nevertheless strong efficiency improvements are needed to close the gap with diesel engines. Diesels, although not widely used in the United States, are still of higher efficiency rating than their GDI counterparts. The introduction of vehicles with gasoline direct injection or GDI and spray guided stratified injection reduces the gap to vehicles powered by diesel. 
The first vehicles with spray-guided combustion systems are now on the market. Remember that this is one of the GDI modes of operation. When comparing engines of the same peak power, some of these stratified spray-guided engines are already at diesel CO2 emission levels. The success of stratified combustion is strongly determined by the injection and ignition system used. Homogeneous combustion is the regular combustion process that we are all used to seeing. Besides the requirements for conventional homogeneous combustion systems, higher ignition spark and breakdown voltage capability is needed. The spark location or spark plug gap itself has to be open and well accessible for the mixture to allow a successful flame center formation and expand into the stratified mixture, while not being influenced by liquid fuel droplets. Stratified is a fancy word for very lean. For the purposes mentioned before, several different ignition concepts have been developed. The most advanced of these is the use of multi-charge ignition system with extended modular ignition by an alternating current ignition, as in the Delphia C2P. Also, a very powerful detection method using ion current sensing technology, like Bosch Trionic, was developed as a part of the modular ignition concept and built into the ignition module. Similar to the diesel combustion, the lean stratified combustion and spark ignited gasoline direct injection engines or GDI produces fuel savings for these reasons. First, unthrottled operation allows for a significant pumping loss reduction, especially at lower loads. This is made easier with the now standard drive-by wire. Secondly, a gasoline engine with direct fuel injection can operate with a higher compression ratio yielding efficiency advantages. Third, the lean stratified mixture being compressed has a higher ratio of specific thermal energy. This allows for a more efficient compression and expansion. Engines with spray-guided combustion systems need a centrally mounted direct injector with preferably a hollow cone spray. The spark plug is placed in close proximity to the injector and positioned such that it is able to ignite a fuel-rich spray-guided swirling mixture created by vortices just outside the spray cone. In order to produce the right spray pattern in the cylinder, nowadays a rail pressure typically in the range of 2200 psi is used. For NOx emission reduction a high amount of exhaust gas recirculation is required and achieved by the use of valve timing overlap. The venerable EGR valve is pretty much out. From an exhaust emissions point of view, a key subsystem that must be added is the lean NOx after treatment, typically in the form of a barium or potassium based NOx storage catalyst. The NOx catalyst will be covered in greater detail later on. GDI versus PFI fuel injection. Multipoint or port fuel injection means there is a separate fuel injector for each cylinder that sprays fuel into the intake port, right before the intake valve. Gasoline direct injection or GDI is a more advanced version of multipoint systems in which fuel is injected directly into the combustion chamber instead of the intake port. This improves combustion efficiency, increases fuel economy and lowers emissions. Diesel engines have long used direct injection, but it is only in the past few years that manufacturers have adopted it for widespread use in gasoline or petrol engines, as it is called in Europe. GDI was first used on the Mercedes Gullwing of the 1950s. It was later changed to regular injection. The biggest aspect of GDI is that gasoline is injected straight to the combustion chamber, as opposed to right before the intake valve. Port injection is a lot less precise. 
since the injection event happens at the intake port or manifold runner and stays there for a few seconds before being sucked to the cylinder. GDI directs the injection event right on top of the piston. The end result is reduced emissions, increased durability, more power and a vastly variable engine able to meet future demands. To be able to adjust the fuel event is extremely important for power generation. Before, the only adjustment possible was that of ignition timing. Then valve timing was developed and the gasoline engine was further improved. Now, with GDI things will go a lot further. GDI exerts its control into ways, by controlling fuel injection rate or amount and event timing. In GDI the fuel injection rate is controlled by pressure, which is held at a nominal 2200 psi or higher, as opposed to the 35 or 60 psi for port injection. The GDI fuel rail is also built sturdier to withstand these pressure and normally has an a wall thickness of about one eighth of an inch. Combined with multiple injection events, GDI can achieve combustion in less crankshaft rotational degrees that PFI. On PFI the injection even may last up to 360 degrees or more of crank rotation and the fuel stays in the manifold runners. On GDI stratified mode the injection event lasts between 0.4 to 5 milliseconds, which is much faster than PFI. The ECM can inject fuel after the exhaust valve has closed, called homogeneous injection or right before the ignition event, called the stratified mode, but more on that later. On these GDI engines everything is controlled and there is no room for mistakes. The injection pulses are controlled exactly, the amount of injection events are controlled, the pressure has to be on the dot and even the shape of the piston top is of absolute importance. The whole idea is to create an air swirl to be able to have a fully mixed air and fuel and even this air swirl is completely controlled by the electronics. All these systems will be discussed later in detail. This channel is for do-it-yourselfers, as well as professional auto repair technicians. We present all the content using the latest CG animation techniques, on hands video, and how-to, tips and techniques. We encourage you to subscribe to this channel now. Once subscribed, anytime we upload a new automotive tip, secret, or technology video, you will be notified. Finally, by subscribing, you will also be part of our weekly freebies. Yes, we're constantly giving away lots of free merchandise. Automotive Diagnostics and Publishing's Mandy Concepcion, the owner of this channel, is one of the most prolific auto technology authors on the web. At any moment in time, we may offer a free book, Kindle eBook, Android app, one of our own diagnostic equipment, or even auto repair software that runs on your PC. Subscribe now free of charge, learn lots of automotive technology secrets, and win free stuff. It doesn't get any better than that. Thanks for watching, and enjoy.